Uh, today's critiques are going to focus on the abstraction. Now, for those of you new to this or you're just coming to this video and you don't know what's going on here, uh, the abstraction is a portrait drawing uh, aid that I learned in art school uh, to do the initial lay-in uh, or the initial sketch for a portrait or a figure drawing. And it was based off the uh, abstraction system of Frank Riley, who used to teach uh, way long ago in the 20th century. And uh, he broke down the figure and the head into a simple abstract version where the forms and the planes and the features all interlock with one another. And I found it was actually a great way to not only draw portraits and do the initial lay-in, but actually to help me in my caricature work when I'm drawing extremely grotesquely exaggerated faces that I want to still maintain a degree of realism and perspective and consistency and anatomy within the caricature. So after doing the initial rough sketch on a caricature, I would overlay an abstraction grid on top of the drawing, or I'd draw the abstraction right on to my uh, rough sketch to see areas that are off, that could be improved, that where the alignment isn't quite right. And because I do like my caricatures to have that sense of reality. And I'm encouraging my students to do the same thing because you want to be able to have control over your caricatures. You don't want them to get away from you and just let distortions reign free. We want to exaggerate the likeness, not succumb to accidental distortions and uh, making stuff too big or too crooked when we didn't intend to. The whole idea here is to just be able to maintain control of what you're doing and to see where you went wrong. And the abstraction is just an aid or a tool to help you do that. Now the abstraction drawings, when we look at them, they're going to be very mechanical looking and robotic. And usually you don't even see a likeness anymore in them. And that's not their point. The point of the abstraction, like I said, is to help fix the structure and the construction of the rough sketches. So that the next step after the abstraction is where we'll actually do our final drawing. And that's where the personality and the likeness will come back into it. So. We're going to be seeing a lot of mechanical drawings today that you will think won't have a good likeness, but that's something we're going to be digging back out of the abstractions in the following step in the next lesson. Uh, so I encourage you all to follow along with the Proco caricature course, uh, where we're um, learning how to develop and refine our caricatures, and we go through all of this step by step. So with that, let's take a look at some recent student works and find out where they could be improved. Okay, and here is the work of Miguel Argueles, uh, who did an Emma Watson. And it's a pretty decent little rough sketch. I like the likeness that's going on there. It's not extremely exaggerated, but that's okay. And uh, the abstraction that Miguel has here got a little off, and it's uneven. It's not quite matched up from side to side. It doesn't look very symmetrical. And again, it looks like he just used the abstraction on top of the rough sketch without actually altering it too much, without altering the shapes or correcting anything. So that's what we're going to do in, uh, in this one here. So let's do my version of the abstraction on uh, Emma Watson here. I like how he did find the skull shape and didn't just draw the abstraction around the outside of the hair because we are concerned with the head construction here, and the hair can sometimes make that a little confusing to find, but you did an okay job there. Just keeping the lines very simple and generic. I don't want to get involved in any of the contours of the face just yet. One thing that I do see right now that I can correct with the abstraction is the neck. The neck seems like it's too far back on the head, and I want to make it look like she's not pushing her head forward so much like as if you have in your sketch here. So I'm going to bring this neck forward, and we can still maintain the appearance of a thin, graceful neck, even if it's a little bit thicker, so I don't think you have to worry about that there. We can actually lengthen it a bit if you want. Now it just feels like the head's sitting on the neck a little bit more naturally. All right, let's find the center line. That's the next important step. I see her head is being turned to the left just a little bit more than what you have in your sketch. So I move the center line of the face just a bit to mimic that angle better. Now let's find the angles of the eyes, nose, and mouth. It's important that all three of these lines are uh, parallel with one another. 
I see that your eyes were actually a little bit deviating from the alignment of the rest of the face. So that's one thing where uh, we'll fix that in this abstraction. Let's find the temple rhythm here. And the circular rhythm of the temple really wouldn't be visible on this far side. It might creep around just a little bit, but uh, not enough to really make a point of sh showing it. So, but it would be something like that, I guess. Well, let's find the brow rhythms. Let's bring this forehead out just a bit because I it seems like I want that rhythm to be a little bit longer on the far side here, this brow rhythm. So stay flexible and stay critical of your drawing at every stage. Don't get stuck just tracing your rough sketch. Make sure you're making corrections with the abstraction. That's what it's for. Let's find the lower orbit of the eyes. The rhythms of the crease of the upper eyelids. These things don't really have fancy names. I'm just describing <laughs> where they're at and what shapes that they're representing. That looks a little uneven. Let me raise the arcing line a little bit higher on the right over here. Okay, now let's find the let's find the ear to chin rhythm here. So her head's tilted down just a little bit, so her ears are up a bit higher than her brow. Right about there. So I like the placement that you have the ears right now, that's good. So I can see here by dropping the ear to chin rhythm down on the left side of the face here that the uh, chin may want to end up coming out a little bit further than what's in the initial lay-in if we want it to be even. So we'll keep that in mind. I'll get to that just a little bit later. Let's find the rhythm of the underside of the cheek down to the nose. And then just laying in her ear on the far side really quick. In the photo, you can't really see her ear on the far side because her head is turned too much. But in caricature, sometimes we do see the ear on the far side more often because, you know, popping them out and exaggerating their width is something kind of fun to do. It's not totally necessary for this sketch, but the hair may end up covering it later. We'll see. And let's go ahead and draw the rhythm from the eyebrow down to the front plane of the nose. Remember that front plane of the nose has to come out in front of the center line of the face just a bit in order for it to look three-dimensional. Let's draw the side planes of the nose down to the bottom. It's going to be one single egg-shaped or oval-shaped rhythm. And let's find the bottom plane of the nose. All right, now let's find the top of the nostril leading into the nasal labial rhythms. Front plane of the chin, which interrupts the nasal labial rhythm. And then we can see how much further past the ear to chin rhythm this nasal labial rhythm goes. I want to make sure it matches on this side over here. And it's wrapping around the head in perspective. Raise this up just a little bit higher. And drop this down a little bit more to make sure they're more even. On her face, I don't see a muzzle rhythm like at all because she has such a young, firm face. But if I were to draw it, it would probably be about here. I don't see any divisions in the face giving me any clues where they're at, but it's good habit to get into to draw the muzzle rhythm if you ask me. Because there might be in some faces where you don't initially see a change in light or form there. Uh, there might be a slight change that you're missing, or if you can insert uh, some plain changes in the final rendering, this will help map out where that's going to be. Because even if her fat pockets on her face are not clearly defined as they would be on an older person, they are there. They're just 
smoothed out at this young age. Okay, and let's go ahead and find the rhythms of the upper eyelids, which runs essentially parallel to the rhythms of the crease of the upper eyes. And let's find the distance between where the inside corners of the eye will be in relation to the center line of the face. So it looks like your eye over here on the right is a little bit too far out compared to the eye on the, uh, on the left. Well, I am changing the position of them a bit, so that's probably why that looks so off. Let's go ahead and draw the orbs of the eyes in right here. And she's looking right at the camera, so the, the pupils and irises will be complete circles looking right at us here. Again, this is not something I always do in my rhythms and abstractions, is to sh show this much details in the eyes, but I, I thought it was necessary. Yeah, I'm going back down to the front plane of this chin here, and I think it will behoove us to uh, change the front uh, shape of the chin a little bit here to bring it out a bit more. Not quite so squared off, but just a little bit more forward. Because one thing distinctive about her is I think she does have kind of a, a distinct chin. It's kind of bony and uh, not a large chin, but it uh, definitely has a distinct presence on her face. And the triangular septum rhythm of the lower face. You can see how the mouth is a bit asymmetrical now. She is smirking, but it looks like it's a little bit too much here. So I'm going to just bring the corner of the mouth out to the left a little bit more here. And the rhythm will be asymmetrical, I think. It's not going to be, you know, since she is smirking, I am going to alter the rhythm to the, her particular expression. It doesn't have to be totally even every time. Whenever you have a Whenever you make a conscious choice to uh, make a crooked shape or an uneven shape, this is the time where you're going to plan it out and make it look good. And remember, the corner of the mouth will not meet the nasolabial rhythm. There's going to be a bit of a gap here, and that's where that node rhythm would be. Even though on her it's not really visible, but this is where they, the nodes would be. They'd be pretty small on her. Okay, and the only other thing I would probably do is create a rhythm for the hair, uh, because it is... It goes off her head quite a bit and has its own distinctive shape, so I'm just going to, as simply as possible, find where that hair is, and it's pretty similar to where you've already drawn it, Miguel. But I keep it as simple as possible. Don't want to get involved in all the contours of the hair just yet. Just want to look for the average shape and draw that in. And there's two locks of hair down here, and I would just express them as one simple connecting shape, because that's kind of what they're doing here. Here's one strand, and here's the other, and they're almost meeting at the bottom there. So everything on the face, you want to make sure you give it a strong sense of design. You don't want to just draw random strands of hair and have them hope that they look okay. Let's go ahead and really plan them out. Here's another sort of lock of hair hanging down in front of her ear. It has a definite S-curve shape to it. So, and this is a case where I'm just modifying the idea of the abstraction and the rhythms to uh, help sculpt her hair in a little bit more of a conscious way. Okay, again, it looks mechanical, robotic, and scary. Doesn't really look like Emma at this point, but I'm confident that her likeness is in there. And if you develop this to the next stage, I think you'll see that it will be a good, more solid sketch than your rough sketch originally was. Thanks for joining me for this quick demo on using the Riley abstraction in caricature. I know it's kind of a boring, plotting, technical thing to do right in the middle of the creative process, but it really does help me in my own work fix my rough, uneven sketches, because I personally don't have a great eye for noticing these things until it's broken down in a real simple, abstract way. In the premium version of this course, I go over lots more student examples uh, showing where they have problems in different areas and how I correct them. And there's a lot of demonstrations in addition to the critiques, so I hope you can get the premium course on proco.com caricature.